Okay, so we're going to take a look at the atomic structure. Um, first of all, we know that the atom here is basically the, uh, the discrete unit that makes up matter, right? And we said that, and Dalton, a scientist, Dalton stated that, Joseph Dalton was a scientist, stated that all matter in the universe was made up of atoms, right? Mm -hmm. And matter is anything that basically has mass, okay? So an atom is basically a discrete unit that makes a matter. Okay, so whenever we look at discrete units that make up something, right, a single discrete unit is called a quantum. So a quantum is a discrete unit that composes a larger substance. So a discrete unit means it's an indivisible unit, right? So an example of a discrete unit is um, um, they have to have numbers that are basically natural numbers. So um, an example of a discrete number would be like a discrete number of chairs, right? So like if I say, 10 chairs, right? This is basically a discrete number because you can't have half a chair, right? What's half yep. a chair? It's not a chair, right? So uh, 10 chairs is a discrete number. So quantum is basically a discrete unit that makes up something. So you can't have half of a particle. You're just having uh, sets of whole numbers or natural numbers of particles, okay? So really, an atom is a quantum. Atoms are quantum or quanta, the plural, of matter. Okay, now there are smaller particles that make up atoms, right? Um, and we're gonna look at some of these particles, and these are called the subatomic particles. Um, make up atoms. Okay, so these subatomic particles will compose atoms, and uh, some of these subatomic particles, um, well, you might have already kind of heard about, is the electron, the proton and the neutron. Okay, so these are some subatomic particles that you would find in an atom. Now there was a line of scientists that were credited for discovering some of these, right? Um, the electron was discovered by a scientist named J.J. Thompson. Okay, and J.J. Thompson created the first um, atomic structure, and he called this the raisin bun model. Okay, so basically how he envisioned it was uh, this is like a raisin bun. So the bun itself is the whole of the atom, and the atom contained these bun these elect these uh, raisins called electrons, right? So it's kind of like a bun that has like raisins stuck on it, and the raisins are the electrons. Now. Um, initially, when this came out, scientists um, were just thinking, okay, well, this this uh, doesn't really make sense because electrons are these really small um, subatomic particles, and if you have them found on an atom, what's holding them together, right? We know that electrons are held together by positive charges. Like, there has to be something positive that attracts and holds these electrons together, right? Because opposite charges will attract. So. Then what happened was J.J. Uh, Thompson's actual, his student, and his name was uh, Rutherford. Rutherford was J.J. Thompson's student, and Rutherford actually did an experiment. And this is an experiment that we kind of want to understand. This is Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Okay, so let's take a look at Rutherford's gold foil experiment. So in Rutherford's gold foil experiment, what he did was uh, he took a piece of gold foil, and this was basically... So this is your gold foil, okay? So this is like 24 karat gold foil, right? And this is important to understand because uh, 24 karat gold is pure gold, right? So pure gold is a pure substance, so the only thing that would make up this gold foil is just gold atoms, right? So gold is AU on the periodic table, right? So gold atoms would make up this gold foil uh, material, right? So what he did, what Rutherford did was he took a thin film strip and he put it on the edge of the gold foil. So what the film strip 
was used for was um, it was basically to capture a certain type of particle. Okay, so this is the film strip. So I'm just going to draw that out. Okay, so this is the film strip. Right, pardon my drawings, but so this is the film. So Rutherford took this film, he took this gold foil, and then what he did was he used a device. Here's a device here. Okay, so to use this device here, and this device um, was surrounded by lead. Okay, so this device is surrounded by lead, and this device shot rays, and these rays are called alpha particles, and these, uh, this device shot alpha particles into the gold foil. Now, what is an alpha particle? Okay, so this is an alpha particle. An alpha particle is basically a helium nucleus. Okay, so we'll take a look at what this is, but an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. It's a, it's a positively charged particle. It's very massive. Okay, so it's a large particle because it's a nucleus. We'll we'll explain what this looks like later. But what Rutherford did was uh, he took these large positive charges and he used this um, particle accelerator and he fired those alpha particles at the gold foil. Right. So whenever you fire fire a large particle at another particle, the particle should collide. Right. So what he thought was. Um, we know that because alpha particles are really largely positive charges, right? If J.J. Thompson's particles, uh, if J.J. Thompson's model of the atom, the raisin bun model was true, then basically these alpha particles should stick to the raisin bun model. Like it should stick to the atom, right? Because remember that J.J. Thompson, he stated that you know these um, atoms contain these electrons, right? This is J.J. Thompson's raisin bun model right and these little dots here these are electrons right so according to JJ Thompson's model you have these negative charges these electrons these electrons are negative charges you get negative charges on the atom if you fire something positive at it it should stick to it right so what Rutherford thought would happen was if, if his teacher, J.J. Thompson, who, who was his actual PhD, um, his professor, right, he was, in, he was a PhD candidate, um, what he, should, he, he thought if um, his, teacher's, sorry, his teacher's model was true, that these alpha particles should stick to the atom and some should pass through. Okay, so this is what he thought would happen, right? Now what the film was used for was uh, when the alpha particles hit the film, it would basically cause a stain to form on the film. Okay, so the film you can't really see alpha particles. Alpha particles are invisible, but they're high energy, positively charged particles. All right. So when you hit uh, when it hits the film, it should create a stain, right? But this is what he actually saw. So this is what JJ. Uh, sorry, this is what Rutherford thought would happen, but this is actually what happened. I'm just gonna erase that. But uh, so this is what actually happened, right? So once again. Um, this uh, container, this lead container, and the reason it's a lead container, lead actually blocks alpha particles, right? Lead can also block other types of heavy particles like gamma radiation, which is given off by nuclear, um, nuclear waste, for instance, like uh, any, anything that decays to an extent, right? So it, it, uh, it basically um, block a lot of high energy particles, right? And high energy particles have tons of energy. So what happens is these alpha particles hits the gold foil, but instead of going straight, just going straight, some of it does go straight, but it gets deflected, right? What he saw was the film actually had stains everywhere, right? And this told him that, you know, the particles got deflected. Well, alpha particles at the time, alpha particles at the time are really highly energetic, but these are very massive particles. They are massive, positive charges. Okay, so they're massive positive charges, right? So in order to def in order for these massive positive charges to be deflected, it had to have to be in contact with another massive positive charge, right? So Rutherford stated that 
So Rutherford's observations from this experiment was that there's some kind of large positive charge that exists in the atom. So some kind of large positive charge exists in the atom. Okay? So he kind of he kind of questioned, okay, what is that positive charge? Now a lot of the alpha particles, there was a stain that got formed here, and a lot of the alpha particles did just go through the atom. Right? So yeah, the atom, the particles did get deflected. These alpha particles got deflected, but some of it still went through, right? So because um, some of the particles still went through, Rutherford also stated that there's a lot of space that exists in the atom, right? So if some of these, if these particles just kind of go through the gold foil, that means that there's a lot of space between atoms, right? So from this notion, Rutherford created some conclusions, okay? So I'm just gonna write the conclusions out. So the conclusions of experiment, right? He called these large positive charges protons. Atoms contain large positive charges. Some of the conclusions of Rutherford's experiment was that atoms contain these large positive charges and these large positive charges are called protons okay so atoms contain these protons right and he stated that the protons are much bigger than electrons right these are massive charges in comparison to the electrons, okay? So that was one of his um, conclusions. The other conclusion was that, I'm just gonna make some space here. The other conclusion here is that, conclusion one, but the other conclusion is that most of the atom is empty space, okay? So most of the atom is empty space because some of the alpha particles, they just go through it, right? And that's why uh, what Rutherford saw was that he saw stains all across the film. So because the particles got deflected in a wide area, right, and there are bigger stains for parts where there was more levels of deflection, right, this told us that, you know, Rutherford stated that, yeah, most of the atom is empty space, right? And just from this, Rutherford's gold foil experiment was instrumental in helping us to develop the model of an atom, right? So J.J. Thompson discovered this negative, this really small negative particle called an electron. His student Rutherford discovered a, a larger particle, a larger positive particle called a proton, okay? And Rutherford also, he created his own model, right? So he took his teacher's work and created his own model of the atom. So this was Rutherford's uh, diagram of the atom. Right. Right. Or you can think of a, this as his model. And what he thought was, you know, he answered some of the questions that were posed by scientists. That okay, so, um, according to J.J. Thomson's model, the raisin bun model, these electrons are just stuck on an atom. Well, you can't keep highly energetic negative charges on an atom without holding it together somehow, right? So there had to be some kind of positive charge. So Rutherford actually thought electrons would be orbiting around these protons. So this is Rutherford's model that he stated that protons were in the center and these electrons orbited around the protons. Okay, so this was Rutherford's diagram, right? Now he didn't talk about how these electrons orbited and so forth, right? Um, but the idea here is that uh, you know these electrons were, are, were being held together by these protons. Now the scientists at the time they were asking them uh, they were asking they were looking at Rutherford's model. Rutherford's model did explain some of the things. Um, specifically, there was this positive charge that was found in an atom. But one of the issues with Rutherford's model is that if electrons are just orbiting around a proton, 
there is going to be this strong attractive force that draws these electrons in, right? Right, and we're assuming that this is going to be a three-dimensional model, right? So if this is like a proton. So if we say that this is a proton, okay? So this is a proton, and these electrons are orbiting around this proton, right? So they're just kind of orbiting around them like that, right? Why wouldn't the orbits just shrink and get closer and closer to the proton? Why wouldn't it just collide into the proton, right? Scientists would have thought that as the orbits got smaller and smaller, right, into, um, into the, the proton, right, the atom itself would disintegrate, right? Like the electron would just collide into the proton, right? So you would expect something to happen like this, right? The electron would collide into the proton, and this is where it would collide, right? Like you would have a collision there, right? So why doesn't the atom just disappear then? Right? So scientists stated that there had to be another particle that must exist in the core of the atom. And so there has to be another particle that exists in the core of the atom. Another big question was that you know you wouldn't just have one proton in an atom, you could have multiple protons. Protons are really massive positive charges, right? What prevents protons from repelling each other, right? If massive positive charges get close together, what prevents them from just repelling each other and causing the atom to just kind of fly out, right? Because in that case, the protons would just kind of, all of the protons would just repel out, right? Okay, so that all the protons would just repel each other out, and the atom would disintegrate, right? So there was these two really big problems regarding Rutherford's model. It was still better than J.J. Thomas's model, but it still posed a lot of questions, right? And we need to ask ourselves, what prevents electrons from colliding into protons? So. Under these questions, um, some of these questions got answered when Chadwick, another scientist, I'm just kind of going over this really quickly, but Chadwick discovered another particle called the neutron. The neutron apparently had relatively the same mass as a proton. So it had relatively the same mass as a proton, but had no charge. Okay, and Chadwick stated that these neutrons were found with protons. All right, so neutrons were found with protons. And this really gave us this first depiction of this notion called a nucleus. Okay. So there's this notion that you know the neutrons were found with these protons, and this constitutes something called a nucleus, right? So together we call these protons and neutrons particles. They're called nucleons. And a nucleon is just really these large particles that make up atoms, and they make up the core of the atom. Okay, and Collectively, the mass of a nucleon, the mass of a proton is relatively equal to the mass of a neutron, okay? And this mass is about 1.67 times 10 to the power negative 27 kilograms, okay? We don't really write this all the time. We don't, we don't really express the mass of these protons in kilograms. We, what we'll do is we'll use another unit, and this is what we call an atomic mass unit. So we'll call it 1 AMU, or you can call it U. It's up to you, right? You can also call it AMU, the same thing, right? So we mostly just use U, right? So 1 U is this mass. So this is 1 U. Okay, and the mass of a proton is approximately equal to the mass of a neutron. A neutron is slightly a little bit bigger than a proton, but that's not important, right? These masses are relatively the same, 
right? So the mass of an electron is about, and if we kind of round this off, it's about one two thousandth of the mass of a proton. Relative is very small, right? It's a, it's basically almost one two thousandth u. Okay, so it's a very small value, right? Because the mass of an electron is this small, we just say that its mass is negligible. So what negligible means is that we don't care about the mass of an electron, right? We don't care about the mass of an electron because it's so close to zero that it doesn't really impact negligible. It doesn't really impact the overall mass of the atom, right? This tells us that most of the mass of an atom comes from the nucleons. Okay? So most of the acid of the atom comes from the nucleons, the protons and the neutrons. Okay? But we were still unsure about what the overall structure of this model looked like, right? So now what what happened here is we had another scientist and this is the sciences that's mostly celebrated in chemistry when you guys start off by learning chemistry. And this scientist, his name was Bohr, Niels Bohr, and Bohr took all of these findings, right, and Bohr created something called his planetary model of the atomic structure. Now, this atomic structure is, um, it's the main type of atomic structure that you guys will learn early on in your years of uh, high school and your first uh, time of studying chemistry. Um, it's, it's somewhat limited, but it's still very useful to understand the overall structure. And the new structure that we will look at later is the quantum mechanical model. Now, in the planetary model of the atomic structure, uh, Bohr kind of uh, related this to the solar system, right? And the way he would look at this, um, he would basically characterize like the nucleus as like the sun. Right, and the planets would orbit around the nucleus, right, in these orbits. So let's say this is planet Earth, right, and this could be like another planet. Let's say this is, you know, planet like, um, say this is like Venus or something, right, and, you know, oh, sorry, let's, let's make that Mars actually. Let's say this is planet Mars, okay, so this is planet Mars and so forth. And what Bohr stated in his planetary model was that um, electrons, which were these planets, orbited around the nucleus. And the nucleus in this case, the nucleus in this case was the sun um, in orbits called shells. Okay. Now the nucleus. He, he stated, and this was um, attributed also to Chadwick and Rutherford, right? Sometimes the Bohr um, diagram, the planetary model, is called the Bohr-Rutherford structure for that reason, because Rutherford had a big hand in this. I feel like Chadwick and J.J. Thompson should also be given some credit. Um, but basically, he stated that the nucleus was composed of the protons plus neutrons. Okay. And really, the idea here is that these protons and neutrons are about the same size. So let's make protons in yellow. Okay, so this is a proton. And let's say that uh, this is a neutron. About the same size. Well, for, our, for our discussion, we'll say that they are the same size. Right? And basically what's going to happen here is that these protons and neutrons, right, they are stuck to each other. And what the neutrons will be doing here, right? What the neutrons do is that the neutrons hold protons together and minimize the electrostatic force of repulsion. And so what they really do is that these neutrons will reduce, will prevent the protons from repelling each other, right? But also, on top of that, they also um, create a uniform 
attraction of electrons, right? They basically um, stabilize the electrostatic force that will attract electrons. So it prevents electrons from actually colliding into the nucleus, okay? Now, we don't need to know this in too much detail, but it would be useful to understand that uh, Bohr stated that electrons will orbit this nucleus in these orbits called shells, right? And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna kind of understand how he came up with this model, right? And his experiment, specifically his hydrogen emission experiment. And we're gonna see how that kind of attributed to this model that he created. Okay, so Bohr did a lot of his experiments. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at Bohr's hydrogen emission spectra experiment. So Bohr did a lot of his Bohr did a lot of his um, experiments on hydrogen, right? Now hydrogen is very light element, right? Um, first of all, we need to explain ourselves. Uh, we need to explain what an element is. So we stated that an atom is the general particle of matter, right? But there's two types of atoms. Atoms can be composed of elements as well as ions. Okay. Now, what's the difference between an element and an ion? Well, elements have, they're basically neutral atoms. So elements are neutral atoms, right? So a neutral atom is basically um, an atom that really has an equal number of positive and negative charges. It wouldn't be useful to say that they have no charge, but they have an equal number of positive and negative, right? And we understand that um, protons are a positive charge and electrons are negative charges, right? So if we're looking at charges, Right, protons are positive elementary charges. Okay, so protons are these positive elementary charges. An elementary charge is a basic unit of charge. It's a discrete unit of charge. So an elementary charge is, you can think about it as a quantum, a quanta of charge, right? It's the, it's the most basic unit of charge, right? It's the building blocks of charge, really, right? So um, protons and electrons are quanta of electric charges. Elementary charges are quanta of electric charges. And protons are positive elementary charges, and electrons are negative elementary charges. Well, these, uh, what an elementary charge, the value of an elementary charge, E, is actually equal to 1.60 times 10 to the power negative 19 coulombs. Okay? A proton is a positive elementary charge, so it's a positive. 1.60 times 10 to the power negative 19 coulombs. An electron is basically a negative elementary charge, which is negative 1.60 times 10 to the power negative 19 coulombs. All charges are a number or a set of these elementary charges. So Q is what we use for charge. And all charges are equal to a number of elementary charges. Okay, so this is N is the number of elementary charges. Right, so a negatively charged object means that it has more negative elementary charges than positive elementary charges. I'm going to use um, n of p or n of e as the number of, right? So for our discussion, what we can look at here is uh, we can express uh, a proton as a plus one elementary charge and an electron as a negative one elementary charge. It really means the same thing. We're just kind of standardizing it, right? So we're standardizing it to represent positive one and negative one. If you have the same number of protons and electrons, then the atom is neutral, and a neutral atom is called an element. Okay. Now, other types of atoms include ions. Ions are what we call charged atoms. Okay. So a charged atom exists where the number of protons is not equal to the number of electrons. Right? If the number of protons is greater than the number of electrons, this is a positively charged atom. 
if the number of electrons is greater than the number of protons, then we have a negatively charged atom. Okay, so we have a negatively charged atom if the number of electrons is greater than the number of protons, positively charged atom if the number of protons is greater than the number of electrons. Okay, having, having said this, let's take a look at Bohr's hydrogen emission spectra, right? So when we think about elemental hydrogen, okay, elemental hydrogen has basically one proton, zero neutrons, and one electron, okay? You can see that one proton is positive one, one electron is negative one, right? Neutrons don't have a charge, so the net charge here is zero. So this implies that this is an element. You have the same number of protons as electrons, right? So let's say that this is the proton, right? And this electron is orbiting around the proton. So this is, the electron is just kind of doing this and doing that, okay? So it's orbiting around the proton, okay? So this is the electron, okay? And what Bohr did was he took this hydrogen, and hydrogen is found as hydrogen gas, right? So it's what we call a diatomic atom, right? So this is hydrogen gas, and hydrogen gas is originally colorless. Okay. So what Bohr did was he took um, a cathode tube, so see, here's a cathode tube. Okay, so this is a cathode tube. Right? And what he did was he um, used some kind of voltage source. So this is the voltage source. I'm just going to erase that. Okay, so this is the voltage source. It's positive and negative, right? And in the cathode tube, what he did was he put hydrogen gas, right? So there's going to be some kind of hydrogen gas here. Okay, so this is the hydrogen gas. It should be colorless, so we shouldn't see it. So don't worry about the color of purple that I'm using here. It doesn't really mean anything, right? And what he did was he ran an electrical current through the cathode tube. Okay, so he ran an electrical current through the cathode tube, okay? So when you run an electrical current through a cathode tube, you're exciting the atoms, right? And there's multiple, there's trillions and trillions of hydrogen gas atoms or gas molecules present here, right? And he actually saw that the color, like the cathode tube started to glow red, okay? So for some reason, the colorless gas now started to glow red. And he wanted to explain, okay, what's happening here, right? Why is why is this colorless gas uh, glowing red when I excite it, when I run energy through it, okay? So to explain this, he created a model, right? So this is a really important model, right? The emission spectra, and emission spectra is, has to do with light, okay? So the emission spectra has to do with light, so we need to kind of first understand some properties of light to kind of go through this, okay? So I'm going to go over some of the general fundamentals of light, and then we're going to go back to what happened in Bohr's emission spectra.